The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, everyone. Welcome to another webinar produced by the International Town and Gun Association, commonly referred to as the ITGA. It's a growing organization addressing timely issues involving campuses, communities, nonprofits, the business sector, and various levels of government. My name is Gary Stewart. I'm a staff member at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, and I'm an ITGA board member. During the next hour, and we're planning on a hard stop at one or a little before, you'll hear from a great group of professionals engaged in town gown work, as well as the topic of the day, the shifting demographics in higher education and related challenges and opportunities. If you have questions today, either during or after our webinar, please email outreach at itga.org. We'll put up the slide again as a reminder near the end of today's webinar as well. When you, if you send in questions after the webinar, we'll follow up and get you uh, answers uh, to the person or the group as directed. So again, that's outreach at itga.org. Thank you. Our first panelist today is Eric Kelderman. He's an award-winning senior reporter at the Chronicle of Higher Education based in Washington, DC. Eric is a co-author of an important report titled The Looming Enrollment Crisis and he'll be walking us through some data points from that report to get us started today. Thanks, Eric, for being with us. Thanks, thanks, Gary. It's, uh, I'm glad to be with you, and I hope everyone finds this, uh, this useful. Uh, we have a few slides that, that we're gonna go through. Um, you know, I think what made this uh, report, uh, I guess, timely, important, uh, and has resonated with so many folks is that we're not just talking about uh, enrollment changes, uh, demographic changes that are in the future, um, I think in the context of, uh, you know, the Great Recession and in the, the very long shadow of that event, uh, you know, I think colleges are, that sort of adds a, another dimension to that challenge. And um, this first uh, this first slide talks about that a little bit, about some of the setup to uh, what's coming in the middle uh, and the end of the decade. So as you can see from the numbers here, um, there actually has been some uh, some increase in enrollment uh, after the Great Recession um, at, within certain sectors. So we, we see an almost 12% increase in the four-year public uh, enrollment and uh, and a, a smaller uh, but still you know a sizable 6% increase uh, in enrollment at four-year private nonprofits. Um, the the big changes that we've seen, the big declines we've seen as the uh, economy has improved and, and the unemployment has gone down is uh, two-year public colleges. Uh, those it would include a lot of uh, adult learners and, and folks who uh, went back to school maybe temporarily to increase their skills, but as the job market has, has improved, uh, they've they've dropped out of the, uh, the education sector and gone back to work, uh, hopefully, probably. Um, and then, uh, the, the big declines we've seen have been in the uh, two-year for-profit and four-year for-profit sectors. And that largely has to do with, uh, or at least in part has to do with the closure of some large national chains, uh, but also I think, uh, you know, some reputational challenges for those, for that sector of, of higher education. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, one one uh, hopefully positive sign for higher education has been this uh, very sizable increase in students who are taking uh, programs, courses uh, exclusively online. Um, and that, that may be one clue to, to a way that uh, some colleges and universities, some smaller uh, institutions that, that don't have maybe a national or international draw uh, can, can maintain robust enrollments or, or revenues into the future. So again, we see uh, an enormous increase in uh, online only learners at four year public and private nonprofit um, and then a, a big decrease of course again in the in the uh, for profit uh, sector um, I'm not quite sure what to make of the two year private nonprofit that may have to do to a certain degree with you know one or two small institutions that um, or actually a large institution I believe that that went from private for-profit to private nonprofit, that shift may have caused that, uh, that enormous increase. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. So the, the thing that a lot of people are focused on, uh, of course, is uh, the change in the demographics. What happened after the Great Recession, after 2008, is that 
um, there was an enormous uh, decline in the in the birth rate, really across most uh, across most racial lines. The the white birth rate had already been flat or declining in the uh, in the upper uh, in the Northeast in New England and then the upper Midwest. Um, and what we're going to see then, as we go to the middle and the end of this decade, is um, the, you know areas of the country that are not <laughs> That are not the Midwest and, and New England that are going to be uh, seeing big changes. Uh, the fast-growing number of uh, Hispanics in the country will, will slow down. The birth rate contracted there as well, uh, and in Af and among African Americans. So we'll see, you know, overall growth uh, above two and a half percent in only really uh, half a dozen or so states, uh, and then. Uh, large, uh, continuing large declines in, in you know, about uh, two-thirds of the, of the nation. Uh, next slide. I think I have one more. So then this is the other dimension to that, which is uh, of, the, of the, uh, the, the impact of the Great Recession. Um, so, yeah, demographic changes are coming. Uh, we see a change in the marketplace for higher education. Uh, and what we see is the, the number of students that uh, – that will be uh, available to go to college come from places where uh, more than half of them uh, are low income. So uh, there's price pressures on higher education right now, a, a big debate about uh, student debt, whether there's too much, uh, who's impacted by that, and whether uh, colleges can, can continue to raise uh, tuition to cover their costs. Uh, as, they, as they deal with that, uh, the students that they are seeking to recruit or that will be available to recruit uh, come from uh, families that have less ability to pay that that increased tuition. And so in the long run, uh, we're really seeing sort of a, a triple whammy on higher education. Uh, fewer students, uh, a more diverse student population. Colleges have typically recruited from uh, the ranks of white, middle, and upper middle class. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the the the, the, the price point has become an issue for many families as well. And so uh, selective or uh, non-selective private colleges, I should say, that, that are charging significant amounts uh, may see the, the greatest uh, pressures uh, on, on student enrollment uh, because they have a, an infrastructure and a labor uh, cost that makes it uh, necessary to charge a certain amount. Uh, but they're, they're having trouble finding students that are uh, they're going to have trouble finding students who are, who are willing and able to pay those amounts. So that's those are my four slides, and and I'm I'm sure there'll be lots of questions about this later on. Yeah, Eric, let's just ask a quick question here before we get to our next panelist. Uh, what sort of feedback did you and the Chronicle of Higher Education receive off the looming enrollment crisis report? Um, and do you expect this issue to to continue to be a focus for regular reporting and analysis going forward? I'm also interested if anyone thought it was too alarmist and, and painted too dour of a of a picture. We we have gotten some feedback from folks that think that uh, you know that sort of the the whole rhetoric about uh, you know the the media uh, what some folks see as a as a media narrative around a, a crisis, right? A uh, closures or uh, mergers coming. Um, so I and I think that's that's fair. I think. Uh, you know, we have to be careful how we frame things in terms of what we know versus what we don't know. Um, but the but the demographic changes are real uh, and they're coming. <laughs> you know, there's there's no there's no doubt that the numbers are are shifting and and will continue to do that uh, uh, for the next decade and beyond. Um, the, the response to the report was uh, was robust. Uh, <laughs> We sold uh, a very, very large number of, of, I don't have a specific number, but I, I know it was one of, uh, among our best-selling uh, reports. Um, and absolutely, as, as things shake out, we'll, we'll definitely continue to cover this. I, I think there's enormous interest in the future of the higher education sector and uh, you know, how it will continue to remain uh, relevant uh, you know, to, to students uh, and, and their families. So once again, the looming enrollment crisis from the Chronicle of Higher Education. I, Eric, uh, as you know, I was in the newspaper business for a long time, and some people think uh, journalism is a is a thing from the past, but a tremendous uh, effort on the part of you and your colleagues in really first-class journalism. So um, congratulations, and uh, thanks again very much. 
Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. Our next panelist is Steve Patterson, mayor of Athens, Ohio, and a fellow ITGA board member. Steve is heavily engaged with a number of statewide and national organizations who are discussing many of the topics Eric just touched on. Mayor Patterson, thank you and welcome. Thank you, Gary, I appreciate that. And Eric, um, I, I really enjoyed reading the report. The report. Um, I didn't view it as an alarmist kind of report. I uh, kind of viewed it as a pathway for those of us who are city administrators of thinking about how we move forward. You know, the city of Athens is home to Ohio University. Um, and uh, Ohio University's probably had its peak of enrollment, which would include not only the city of Athens with Ohio University, but, but also um, all the regional campuses and centers across the state. And, and uh, I think I've got a slide to where in 2016, we were looking at uh, a student enrollment, total student enrollment of about 36,000. Um, but then 2017, we started to see a slight, slight drop uh, and then 2018, and then you can see 2019, our enrollments were down to 32,000, um, which may not sound like a lot, um, but when you look at the city of Athens to where we, you know, our largest employer is Ohio University, and with that drop in enrollment, you're going to see a drop in staffing and faculty. Um, and that's where the kind of the, the red flag started going up for us. And we started noticing in 2017 that revenues, they weren't necessarily flat, but we were certainly seeing some changes in the revenue coming into the city where our budget is typically, our revenue is typically about $44 million. We started seeing it dropping down 2018. We definitely did 2019. And um, the other sector, um, that we really started seeing some changes, especially uh, today, is in the real estate and rental sector. The city um, of Athens has about 80% uh, of our housing stock, which is rental units. Now, to, to further clarify that, um, within the neighborhoods themselves, the single family, the R1 neighborhood, single family neighborhoods, um, we see anywhere from 6% being rental units to 36 percent again for r1s and with those what's interesting is we're seeing a lot of those uh former rental units that were student rental units sitting vacant longer um i guess the upside of that is that where there's also a big need i think this is holds true for a lot of university communities uh where we have uh, you know strong town gown relationships or just town gown relationships is that we're seeing housing stock that was carved up for you know three or being a realist more than three unrelated living in some of these rental units coming back as single family homes um, which is a change we're seeing here in athens and and elsewhere um you know some of the the strategies that we're looking at or currently deploying um and i think other other town gown um uh, cities and villages and boroughs are looking at this as well as in terms of diversifying our local economy is is um, things like having what was otherwise large vacant buildings or facilities turned into things like esports, which is really kind of becoming all the rage. Um, it's it's also catering to what a lot of the incoming classes are looking for. It's the world in which they're living. Um, we're fortunate in that part of the city is surrounded by the only national forest in the state of Ohio, uh, the Wayne National Forest. And we're we're working with the National Forest, the US Forest Service, to create an 88 mile mountain biking trail system, which the city is willing to invest in this to make it happen because we view that as being a draw uh, to get people to come here. I know that Ohio University is also looking at ways which we can partner to create a uh, um, a way in which we can program that they can program that into their outdoor uh, sports rec at the university so there's a lot of kind of being as strategic as we possibly can because we're looking down a long window like i think most uh town gown um, environments are you know the other thing that we're very keen on in the city and i'm very keen on and a lot of this is my 18 years of teaching experience at ohio university and I think this is, holds true in other places, 
is partnering for experiential living it, um, experiences for students coming here. I often joke, but I'm serious at the same time that you know I view the city as being a rural urban lab, and as long as as a department doesn't deploy something that ultimately burns down the city, I'm I'm willing to open up that level of experiential learning, whether it's the College of Engineering, the College of Education, uh, you know, arts and sciences, you name it. You know, if we if we can find ways to attract students to the OU via experiential learning out in the environment and getting out of the bricks and mortar. Um, I'm all about working through things like that. Um, and you know, back to how municipalities can augment universities and colleges in student recruitment is by doing things like that. Really kind of push the envelope on what, what experiential learning is. Um, because the, the, the stronger you can make that, the more you're going to be attractive to students because look face it we're looking at fewer students due to a number of factors and again this is all spelled out well in uh, eric's um, report and that is that you know with college credit plus we're getting more and more students coming as juniors uh, so they're here for two years um, the cost of higher ed strong economy makes for an, a, an environment to where students are going straight from graduating to high school into the labor force and getting paid well. Uh, and then again, a, a fewer graduating senior classes from high schools. And again, I don't think we're gonna see that bottoming out anytime in the near future. So Steve, we have a question here for you, but before I get to it, I just wanna welcome folks who are just signing in um, from around the country and overseas. You're listening to the International Town and Gun Association webinar higher ed shifting demographics, town gown challenges and opportunities. If, if you have questions along the way today or after today's webinar, please send them to outreach at itga.org. Uh, Mayor Patterson, just on that experimental learning too, I, I think sometime we should send out on the ITGA listserv to get a sense of how many of our campuses and communities have downtown uh, business incubators um, that are on the tax rolls and are, are proving uh, entrepreneurial uh, activities for students. Here's a question for you, Steve. Uh, you have the unique resume beyond your Air Force experience of having a career as a faculty member at Ohio University and now as the mayor of Athens, home of Ohio University. What piece of advice would you give someone new to town gown work in terms of finding common ground, especially when shared quality of life issues and economies are involved? Well, right off the bat, you know, one of the things that I would do is learn about the International Town Gown Association um, and the the partnership, um, the community that is within ITGA is as you're trying to figure things out because ITGA is a great um, resource for understanding not just something like the, this topic, but other topics that surround the world of of town gown relationships. That's number one. Number two. You know, I would really um, try as best you can to understand the university workings, the university's administration, engage with the student body. I often attend the student senate meetings as well as graduate student uh, senate meetings. Uh, and on the flip, I would certainly understand the neighborhoods in, that make up your community, uh, especially those that that um, are bordering the university or college, but also those further away, because that kind of becomes your silent majority, and it's it's a bad assumption to think that since you're not hearing from them, that there aren't um, issues that they're experiencing as you get further away from the core of your uh, university community. Uh, but those are some of the things that I would certainly recommend. Yeah, I think it's very interesting that a lot of times there's there's mistrust between a campus and a community. And a lot of times it's just because people aren't seeing each other enough. There's not regular meetings, we're not connecting enough. And um, then mistrust can develop and sometimes there's nothing there. It's just, uh, we're, not, we're not talking to each other enough. So I think you're doing a good job modeling that out at uh, Athens. And uh, we thank you very much uh, for, uh, for chiming in today. Thank you, Gary. Our next panelist is CEO of the Chicago Loop Alliance, Michael Edwards. The Chicago Loop Alliance creates, manages, and promotes high-performing urban experiences, attracting people and investment to the loop, including components of higher education. 
The chair of the ITGA Outreach Committee, Julie Ems from DePaul University, is regularly engaged with the Chicago Loop Alliance. Michael, thanks for being with us, and we look forward to hearing about the Chicago Loop Alliance, its important work, as well as relationships with institutes, institutions of higher education. Uh, thank you, Gary, and uh, welcome everybody to the webinar. Um, as you indicated, the mission of the Chicago Loop Alliance, or the CLA, is to create, manage, and promote a high-performing urban experience that's attractive to both people and to investors. To us, the contribution of a robust and compelling higher education sector within the loop is a critical piece of a high-performing uh, urban experience. That said, and as we've heard already today, higher education in the loop is trending as others around the nation, suffering from the impact of the Great Recession, decreased high school graduation rates, and a changing perspective on the perceived value of a college degree, all putting downward pressure on university enrollment. Still, we believe the, higher, the density of higher education here in the loop is quite unique to Chicago and unusual in the nation, providing us with, as the mayor indicated earlier, in our case, a living urban laboratory for students that will enhance their university experience. As such, Chicago Loop Alliance is committed to addressing issues of concerns to universities, such as those found in the Cleary Act, and in assisting in the creation of this unique urban learning laboratory. So what can or should a downtown manager like myself do to support their universities? Um, they, uh, they need to, what they need to do is they need to make a real connection to the university, the universities themselves, create a positive urban experience uh, for the students and engage the students in a meaningful way. Here in the Chicago Loop Alliance, we have over 22 universities uh, that make up uh, the, all of these students. Uh, downtown organizations must, must connect at the highest levels of higher education, of the higher education institution. So CLA holds an annual university luncheon, not the easiest thing to coordinate for university provosts, presidents, and key leaders to discuss issues of joint concern and to set our agenda for the year ahead. Typically, this surrounds issues of safety. We have three university presidents on various CLA boards of directors that provide us with ongoing feedback throughout the year. And the CLA has inserted itself beyond the loop into the broader Chicagoland area of higher education, and we're part of that conversation as well. Working closely with university real estate and facility professionals on downtown issues such as leasing and building permits is also important. Anything you can do to reduce the friction of, of managing an urban environment, managing a university in an urban environment, even things like loading and unloading zone issues, pedest providing pedestrian count information, street closure information, and even construction updates can all make the life of the university much easier and more, uh, more productive in the downtown environment. A clean environment is critical to attract students and, frankly, their parents. In order to secure commitments to uh, attend a university in the loop, clean streets, curves and sidewalks, removal of all graffiti tags, keeping infrastructure in good repair, all create the impression that the loop is taken care of and that they and their children will be taken care of too. Whether the universities are recruiting high school students, mid-career adults, or new underserved students, everybody wants to work, learn in a clean and living, inviting environment. CLA provides street, uh, teams of street ambassadors to increase the civility in and around many of our urban campuses. They provide a high degree of hospitality, directions for visitors, and comfort to students and parents. Their job is to assist in managing panhandling and homeless issues, and even provide student escorts from late night events. This is all done to increase the sense of safety in the loop and meet our own expectations of a high performing loop experience. In addition, we have armed off-duty officer, uh, police officers on occasion to work closely with the Chicago Police Department and the universities to anticipate issues and decrease any reported crime in and around the university campuses. Of course, a successful urban laboratory would be one that is beautiful, interesting, and provides for a sense of discovery. From landscaping to public art to interesting retail and plenty of coffee shops. We want to provide our students with a local welcome. We work closely with the university and the student councils 
We want to know when they are in the process of recruiting students and their parents. We want to know the dates and times of student move in and when classes begin. We want to know when graduation is and key marketing information to welcome them, inform them and congratulate them on their choice to attend a university in the Chicago Loop. Downtown events provide a way for students to experience their neighborhood, as the uh, mayor had indicated. At Chicago Loop Alliance, we partner on university events such as Manifest, which is an annual Columbia College of Chicago Student Street Art Festival. We also invite them to many of our own events designed to bring people into downtown and to have an up close and personal experience in the Chicago Loop. We like to invite our students to discover places and things in the urban environment on their own through our placemaking efforts, providing, providing surprise and delight for them as part of their education experience. Finally, we completely understand that the attraction and retention of talent is a competitive advantage to business districts. We're kind of all over this in many different ways. As such, we engage the universities, its faculty, and its students in the work of Chicago Loop Alliance. Faculty is employed often in research and reports on issues and does research on important issues important to the Loop and useful to the Chicago Loop Alliance. CLA annually hires interns in the areas of graphic design, marketing, and urban planning, among others. We also, also use, utilize our membership organization to accelerate the connections between students and our member businesses for internships, further their education, and jobs upon graduation. This is both good for our members and downtown, but certainly good for students and their universities. So in conclusion, universities and their downtown uh, and urban locations have mutual interest. What's good for one is pretty much good for the other. Downtown organizations can assist universities deal with important issues, specifically with regards to the impact of the Clery Act to improve student retention and recruitment rates. And downtown organizations can enhance the higher education experience positively, impacting student enrollment, retention, and graduation rates. Thank you. Michael, that was tremendous. And uh, we're sitting here in, in my office in Ithaca, New York at, at Cornell, and, and uh, my intern Oliver is from Los Angeles, so he's just sitting here taking notes like crazy about the, the good work you guys are doing in Chicago, because I have a feeling when he gets out of here, he's going to go back and run Los Angeles. So. Uh, we appreciate <laughs> we appreciate that uh, that very much. And, and we have a question for you, but I just want to do a couple housekeeping things. For if you're just joining us, uh, we appreciate people uh, sending us questions at outreach at itga.org. Keep them coming. You're listening to a webinar, the ITGA webinar, Higher Ed Shifting Demographics, Town Gown Challenges and Opportunities. And the fact that um, we just heard from friends in Chicago, um, prior to that from Athens, Ohio, at the top of the show um, from Washington, DC, says something about the, the width and breadth of the ITGA. Uh, our little town here in Ithaca, we're 30 miles from an interstate and uh, we've got a little boutique airport and uh, that's about it. But it's it's just the, the what ITGA is all about, big, small and in between. And we're all working on town gun relations on a daily basis. So. Michael, here's a question for you. According to the CLA's uh, most recent economic impact report, companies are returning to the loop. Why do you think that is? Because we do such a great job? No, <laughs> just kidding. Um, oh, well, I think, I think for a lot of reasons, there's lots of different sectors that are really uh, performing very well in the Chicago loop, and education is certainly one of them. So 2014, we had 65,000 students in the loop, which is a fairly small area, over 22 universities. Uh, we do that study every five years. It was down to 58,000, trending very much like your first speaker. But, I, but at the same time, we continue to attract companies because, in part, because of the educational quali quality and what I would call a thick, thicker labor pool here in the loop. There's 325,000 people that work in the loop every day. And many of those employers are looking for young talent and having 60 or 55,000 students uh, next door and within walking distance uh, is a really great way for companies to access talent both in the near term and then over the long term. So I think it's the density of the students that we have here. It's the variety of degrees that we have here across multiple disciplines, um, including arts and culture. Um, and I think all of those provide 
support for the growing tech sector that is slowly moving into the loop or more slowly moving into the loop. So there may be degrees in technology in the schools in the loop. I'm not familiar with those. We don't deal with those. But all of the folks that we deal with graduate and go to work for companies that may have a tech focus because they need finance people, they need graphic artists, they need, um, they even need artists uh, themselves. So we think it's uh, it's certainly an attractor that's that's bringing companies to locate here. Well, Michael, thank you very much. And I just want to note that I really appreciated the help of uh, your colleague Kiana in getting us ready for this webinar. And I know you're so busy out there and, and very much appreciate you taking your time to be with us. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Our final panel, panelist is John Comerford. He's the president of Otterbein University in Westerville, Ohio. Since its founding in 1847, Otterbein has been recognized for its groundbreaking integrative studies curriculum, its standing among the country's first co-education institutions, and its commitment to serving the public good. President Comerford, thank you for being with us and the support from you and your colleagues for the ITGA. Well, thank you for having us, Gary. And we've been all nodding along, knowing that we're all in this together and lots of good ideas. This has been a great experience so far. Uh, we at Otterbein are in the same state as you've heard uh, Steve talk about before. And so we are part of the national trend here that Eric showed you at the beginning of the webinar about declines in the number of high school graduates. And you can see on the chart of the left there on your screen, uh, how that looks in Ohio and a 17% decline uh, over a 16 year period is significant. And so the first thing that what we have to step back and realize is that uh, we're gonna have to be reaching into non-traditional student populations, that the traditional 18 year old population is not gonna be growing around us here in Ohio. And so we have to be thinking differently. The other thing we have to realize is that most colleges don't do a good job of differentiating themselves. That if you went to a campus tour at Otterbein or Ohio University or you name it, you're probably going to get a similar sort of a vibe. You're going to be told about small classes and faculty that know your name in a caring environment. I'm sure that's true, but how we really set ourselves apart. Let's not say better than other institutions, but here's what we do that's really unique here is going to be important as we move forward. So as you can see on the, on the right, we've been able to focus on a couple of those areas and have seen enrollment growth here at Otterbein uh, despite those headwinds. And so we'll hit on a couple of ways that we've been focusing on doing that, starting with the next slide. Starting first with how do we get some of these non-traditional student populations to our campus? We have engaged with Columbus State Community College, which is the big community college here in the central Ohio area. And we're the only school to have a dual admissions program with them. So that is to say that when you're admitted as a new student at Columbus State, you can also be admitted to Otterbein that same day. You get one academic advisor to see you through a, a comprehensive four-year experience. And so that gap between the two years of the community college and hopefully two years and four-year to get your bachelor's degree is closed as we've intentionally built that pipeline for our students. We also, starting five or six years ago, launched what we call the Urban School Districts Initiatives, where we partnered with a number of central Ohio school districts that had higher than average uh, rates of free and reduced lunch, thinking that they had lots of students in there that were surely college material, but not, might not be able to think they could afford to come to a place like Otterbein. And so we did special financial aid programs in those school districts. Just a couple of years ago, we decided, hey, that was going really well. And so why don't we do that for the whole state? And so we launched what we call the Opportunity Scholarship that says for that originally said for students that were Pell eligible. We've since amended that to say that if your family makes $60,000 or less, Otterbein will meet your full need for tuition. This speaks directly to one of the big issues we have in higher ed, which is our, our pricing conundrum, that we have a lot of families that equate price with quality, even though that's utter nonsense and we can prove that to you. Um, but they you can't be the cheapest in the marketplace. And so that puts you in a place though where our sticker price for our tuition is going to be off-putting to a lot of first-generation college students and low-income college students. So how do you cut through that noise? And so that's what the Opportunity Scholarship has been designed to do to say that Otterbein can be affordable for students with high financial need. We also did a thing called tuition transparency where instead of we bring you in at a certain, uh, certain price point uh, and then we raise the price six, seven percent every year on you, which if, uh, if your discount rate is near 50%, which is what it is at most private institutions, that a 5% increase in the sticker price is a 10% increase out of pocket. 
we don't want to play that game with students. And so we just told them, hey, for the next four years, tuition will go up about an inflationary rate of about 2%, and there'll be no surprises. Uh, so we've been trying some things. Veterans are on there as well, but we're adding a new recruiter there to be able to get into these new student populations. If you go to the next slide, once those students arrived on campus, you can see that we've added a program called RISE, a program called NEST, to sort of be able to make sure we're providing them mentorship and support even before they start as real students uh, with an with a early bridge program over the summer. And that all this has resulted in an increase in Pell eligible student enrollment by 41%. That, that is uh, real significant growth. And if you look at uh, that, that original slide we started at that saw that line go up at Otterbein in terms of our enrollment, that is really driven by those Pell eligible students on that line. And so if you go back a couple of slides, you can see that that has grown 41%. We have at the same time doubled the number of students of color on our campus to now being about 20% of the student body. The last two classes have been closer to 23, 24% students of color. We've tripled enrollment out of those urban school districts we partnered with early on five, six years ago. And all this adds up to that's the way that we've been able to buck some of these trends. Uh, and we wanna emphasize that this often is assumed to mean you're going to accept lower quality students. That has not been the case here at Otterbein. Those students have maintained our academic quality, and you can see some of the stats there on your screen. And those student populations, first gen, low income and students of color, have ret retained at equal to or higher than our institutional average. So we have not sacrificed any quality in doing this, and we're very pleased with how that's been working out. If you go to the next slide, this idea of distinctiveness also a scenario where we all need to work. How, how are we different than other institutions? And for us, part of that answer is in corporate partnership and engagement. Liberal arts colleges like Otterbein get beat up, and I will say unfairly beat up, but beat up nonetheless uh, for not being relevant to today's, today's economy. We don't need liberal arts students anymore. What we need are these very narrow technical fields. Well, we believe in the breadth that liberal arts provides, and we're gonna keep doing that, but we can partner that educational experience with a practical experience with, as you see on your screen, a number of uh, employers and companies that are actually on our campus doing R&D on our campus. The Point is a building we opened just two years ago that houses uh, those companies and our engineering program. And a condition of their lease in the building is that they be engaging Otterbein undergraduates in their R&D work. So that on average, 20% of their R&D teams are Otterbein undergraduates. That creates a real distinctiveness to the Otterbein experience that is only possible thanks to the corporate community in Westerville and Columbus and beyond. If you go on the next slide, that really helps emphasize how important we think about our location. Westerville is a town of 40,000 that is a first ring suburb of Columbus, Ohio. And we have built a partnership with the city uh, the local school district, the local library, the local chamber of commerce to make sure we're, we're, we're rising hopefully together because we will, we will rise or fall together. And in fact, the city of Westerville was a partner in the point uh, that they helped create that facility and create that program because it created for them 100 new jobs and $17 million of new payroll. So it's good for the city, good for us as rec we recruit students and we think helps answer that distinctiveness question that's gonna be so important as we all move forward. So it's not to say we have this necessarily all figured out, but we have a few years of success here thanks to real partnership with our local companies and our city that we're in. And we're very lucky to be in Westerville, Ohio. Well, thank you, President Comerford, and thanks for folks who are sending in questions to outreach at itga.org. And even though it's relatively young, the point has uh, just grown in reputation. And I was talking to someone here the other day and they heard about the point and the question was, how come we can't have a point? So it's like, <laughs> you guys are doing great work and getting a good reputation uh, from outside campus in and, and Westerville. So congratulations on that. Well, thank you. And, and, and we're giving tours all the time because the more <laughs> work like this we do and work, deliberate workforce development, the better we'll all be. Uh, President Comerford, here's a question for you. So. Um, I know this past October, uh, CNN and the New York Times hosted the fourth uh, 2019 Democrat, Democratic presidential, presidential debate out of your place. And coming up in March, uh, you're gonna be having a, a group of uh, 
diverse uh, political interest visiting to talk about uh, climate change, part of the uh, World War Zero. I believe John Kerry is going to be there, former Governor uh, Schwarzenegger, um, former Governor um, Kasich, is that how you say his last name? Kasich, yeah. Kasich, yes, thank you. And can you tell us a little about uh, World War Zero and how you anticipate colleges and communities working on climate change together in the future and may this be something that could enhance the uh, the profile of higher education in terms of changing times, uh, specifically dealing with climate change? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, Gary. And, and uh, I, one of the reasons that a lot of us work in higher ed is because at least I believe a lot of the solutions to our shared problems in society often come from college campuses. This is the, the place that often creates the solutions and, and takes those bold steps. And so, especially because we're dealing with a, a younger population of students, we know sustainability matters to them. This is critically important as they tour our campus and our cities. And so our partners in Westerville and beyond understand that. So we're actually partnering with the city of Westerville to hire a new campus sustainability coordinator to, to coordinate projects between the city and the campus, because if we're gonna do something, it's gonna be better to do it together. Uh, and we really think that opportunities like the climate change summit with World War Zero we're gonna have here in a couple of weeks illustrates that that conversation can best happen on a college campus where different viewpoints are welcome. If you, if you listen to that list, there's two Republicans and a Democrat, and, and we think that's a great thing. And the participants in that think it's gonna be a great thing because if you can't have the, a conversation with someone different than yourself anywhere, at least you can still do it on a college campus that's a part of the educational experience here. So we think that puts us a, as a higher education sector in a leadership position on an important issue like climate change. Thank you. Here's a question for everyone. Um, sometimes I think people in our line of work use the phrase town gown and just assume that everyone knows what it is. Um, and a lot of people don't. And I think it's like one of those things like being in a meeting where someone throws an acronym out or someone's first name and it's like, what are we talking about? So town gown, just consider that some don't know what it is. Um, this is a group question for everybody. How would you describe it, town gown? What And what's it look like uh, when it's working well? And Let's start with uh, Mayor Patterson, please. Sure, uh, you know, town gown in my mind and my experience is, is I think often it gets a, uh, there's a negative connotation to it. I don't view it that way and I never have. I always viewed it as just the strength of the relationship that you have in your community and within your university and the two working you know, symbiotically together as a unit as opposed to two separates. Now I know that's not always been the case, but uh, certainly under my administration, we have uh, torn down you know, more uh, minor obstacles. We have what's called the, the, um, a voluminous memorandum of understanding um, for joint partnerships with the university, everything from salt purchasing to paving of streets, which the university owns some and the city owns a lot. Um, but again, that's a, another sign of a true town gown relationship that is working effectively as to where you've got strong ties, strong partnerships and strong relationships um, as you move forward. So um, like I said, I've heard I've heard negatives on this with with the the name the term town gown, but uh, for as a mayor, I've never viewed it as negative. I always view it as as opportunity as we move forward. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to ask Eric Kelderman this question. Um, working journalist uh, in higher education field, Eric, does, does that phrase pop up much in your in your day to day work? You know, uh, only when things go wrong. <laughs> um, you know, I think maybe to our fault a little bit, you know, we focus on what happens on campuses uh, primarily, uh, you know, but we we dip into these waters uh, occasionally. And I think, you know, the, su the success stories uh, uh, have been several. We, we don't necessarily cover them, but for instance, uh, my, my colleague Karen Fisher I uh, did a terrific piece on Pittsburgh a few years ago and, and the, how, the, how the higher education institutions in that city uh, helped revitalize it. And so um, on the downside, you know, I think where a lot of these things uh, come up are, um, you know, when uh, 
a city gets strapped for, say, tax revenues, and there start to be grumblings about uh, private institutions not paying property taxes and the, the services they eat up. Uh, so, you know, successful uh, successful collaboration, I think, is is key for for these institutions, especially when they're, um, you know, if they're the largest employer in the region, then I think sometimes you know the the relationship, in some ways, is is easier to manage because. Uh, most people in the community recognize, uh, you know, the, the, the financial uh, impact of those places. Uh, in places like Boston, where you know uh, you can't throw a rock without hitting a, a private college, right? That's a different story, a little bit. I mean, that's an industry that's important to the city, uh, but also it, it, you know, it, it demands resources from the city at the same time. So, I, I would say, uh, you know, we we're aware of it, but but we probably don't cover it as much as we should. Michael Edwards, uh, town gown in, in a big urban area like Chicago, does that phrase ever pop up? Uh, no, not really. It's viewed as a super important sector within the overall economy of the loop. And um, I think most of the time people are both on the university side and the business side are looking to align agendas. And I think we've been fairly successful with that here in Chicago. Thank you. And finally, President Comerford, back to Back to the question of like town gown and and um, what does that represent for you in uh, Westerville, Ohio? Well, thanks, Gary. And, and if it's town gown, then I guess I'm not dressed appropriately today. My my gown is at the cleaners. <laughs> um, the uh, I, I have certainly been in communities, and luckily Westerville ha has not been this way, where there is some town gown tension uh, that uh, the local residents view students and even sometimes faculty and staff as transient and not really invested in local community. And likewise, there's, there's sort of a gap, if, especially if it's a blue collar sort of a city or something like that. And that can be problematic. I think it's important for colleges and universities to not act like the ivory tower on the hill, sort of above and disconnected from the community around them. It's on us to make sure the ivory tower falls and we're reaching in directly into the economy and local needs. Uh, and how can we be of service? We are all public or private, uh, for the most part, charities. And it's part of our mission to reach out and meet needs. Likewise, it's important that folks locally understand that there's an opportunity to embrace diversity. Like for example, you saw our numbers at Otterbein, we're very lucky that Westerville has embraced our increasing diversity on campus. Uh, and because that's an important additive thing for the town. Uh, it's also the case that uh, if you're lucky enough as a town to have a college or university uh, there, then that's a that's a pipeline for future workforce and entrepreneurs and, and really can be an important part of your future. And so I think for the most part, if both parties understand how uh, working together is going to be critical, it usually goes well. Uh, President Comerford, another question for you. Uh, you've had the pleasure of connecting with statewide and national leaders on any number of issues. Uh, do you think the challenges facing some colleges, college towns with shifting demographics and, and some colleges literally closing like many have in Vermont and elsewhere, so do you think the challenges facing some college towns are on many of the radars of our leaders today and what can campus and community stakeholders do to elevate this conversation? Yeah, I think it is high on the mind, especially as we started with uh, Eric showing us the, the wonderful demographic picture of, of, the, of the decline of the traditional college age going population across the country at this point. And so if a college university is in your town and is an important part of your economy, that's got to make you nervous. And so the way I think to elevate this conversation is on campus and in town, we cannot be elitist about the way we think about our futures. Um, we have to be open to serving new populations. We have to be about something bigger and more important than rankings and prestige. And, and I worry when I see campuses and situations where they want to go back to the way it was 30 years ago and they want to not reach into those new populations where they think uh, if we just reach the top 10 or top 100 on whatever list, then they'll come. The reality is, no, it is too competitive an environment to think that way. You've got to reach out. And so that's really a partnership uh, that uh, understanding the diversity you're going to bring, understanding when you're talking to policymakers that the more open you are uh, and the more linked directly to workforce development you are, the more good you're going to do for your community. Mayor Patterson, I want to ask you the same question because you're in a lot of uh, statewide and national uh, organizations as well. 
what are you hearing uh, when you're when you're talking, for instance, to the National League of Cities uh, on this issue about uh, struggling college towns? You know, I'm, I'm hearing, you know, almost mirror image uh, or identical image to to uh, the a Chronicle of Higher Ed report. You know, when I'm talking to, to people at the National League of Cities, um, when I'm talking to people across the state. You know, I was just talking to Mayor Easter. Matt Easter is the mayor of Rio Grande, which is a very small village in Southeast Ohio that is also home to uh, uh, Rio Grande University. And they, you know, I was asking about their enrollments and he said, they're going down. His income tax base is 1.5%. And for someone who's the chief exec executive for a smaller village, um, it's really, has him stressing a little bit, but I would contend that it also makes you become more creative. You know, one of the things that we're working on locally is, um, and this could uh, help with retention over the summer months, is we're working with Ohio University to create training ships that students would be receiving credit if they want to help solve some of the big problems. We were just talking a minute ago about climate change and sustainability, you know, which, Athens, what we would like to become known as is a, a city in Southeast Ohio that is leading the charge, um, at least regionally, for being good stewards of the planet, uh, if nothing else, our own environment, and getting the student body on board with that, which a lot of them are interested, but trying to create um, programs over the summer months so that we're not losing students over the summer and then thinking, hey, I don't think I want to go back, you know, keep them here, keep them engaged, but keeping them engaged with, with various city organizations, different departments across the city. I mentioned, you know, we've got a Department of Engineering and Public Works, which has so much great exposure for individuals who are interested in the world of, of climate change and sustainability. Um, so it's just being creative. Uh, again, lifelong learning is another thing that uh, has come up and we're dedicated to that. And I'm hearing that across the board, people saying I've got to pivot and attract different sectors of individuals to come to, back to the university. Thank you. Um, if we could go back to um, one of Eric's first slides, painful year for nonprofits, um, question from a webinar participant um, wondering if there's, uh, Eric, if you're seeing if, uh, any new data coming forward uh, regarding this and any sense on like what we what we might be looking at uh, in the next ten years? Uh, so actually, the slide is painful year for for profits. Painful yeah, years exactly. for for profits. We've seen a huge uh, uh, contraction in the for profit sector. Yeah. We have seen, uh, of course, the nonprofit colleges closing in in Man, Massachusetts, and, and Vermont, and New England. It's not clear, uh, and I haven't seen any definitive data that shows that. The number of closings or mergers right now is is say significantly greater than it has been in the past. I think there's there's some uncertainty about that. There was recently a book uh, that came out by uh, some researchers, uh, Bob Zensky and folks, about um, measuring the fiscal health of of colleges, and they used uh, four data points uh, that they gleaned from uh, the uh, something called the iPads. That's the uh, the institutional uh, data on uh, a variety of factors that the U.S. Department of Education captures. The, the researchers use that to, to gauge how, what, I guess, what percentage of institutions were were really uh, in danger of closing in in the near term. I think they came up with a figure of like 10% uh, of colleges that were that they felt were really on on thin ice, uh, fiscally speaking. Another 30% that are struggling. Uh, or I'm sorry, 60% that are, are struggling, but but not in, in deep danger, and then uh, the remainder that are, are relatively healthy. Um, you know, it's it's hard to know. <laughs> you know, prognostication is really difficult. Higher education has been through contractions in the past. Uh, certainly, it's faced other challenges. So, I, I think until we get there, we won't really know you know, how, how it's going to all play out. I, I really would be sort of uh, irresponsible if I were to sort of try and forecast uh, the long term or even the, you know, the, the midterm in terms of, um, you know, how many more colleges are going to close or merge or whatever. It's, it's really not, 
uh, it's really not clear. And then one final question on the report that you co-authored, the looming enrollment crisis. Is there any college, any private or public that just is like, just adapted a brand new model and then suddenly things are going really well for them? Um, obviously, Otterbein has, has reflected a lot of success on how they're doing business now. Any right. other any other college or university that comes to mind? I, I don't want to point out any individual institutions. I think a, a number of places are doing some things right, right, uh, and are seeing some success like Otterbein. Um, and there's a few strategies, I would say, that, that that different institutions are using uh, to help them uh, in the present, and it, you know, we'll see how long that lasts for many of them, right? It, it, it's, again, it's hard to know how how the future plays out, but of course, um, you know, recruiting, uh, in, increasing your your effort to recruit uh, different uh, categories of students. The Otterbein president talked about that, right? Adult learners are an area where I think a lot of institutions are sort of uh, ripe. Uh, for for you know those students uh, are out there and and um, could maybe use some reskilling right for their for their jobs or some upskill. Um, certainly, diversifying your your student base in terms of <clears throat> racial demographics uh, is going to be crucial for institutions down the road. Um, building sustainable online programs uh, is another area where we've seen a lot of success. Um, some shorter term strategies uh, have been things like um, uh, what we call tuition reset, where <clears throat> instead of say having a, a high a high sticker price tuition and then offering a, a lot of financial aid, um, colleges have have made significant reductions in their sticker price, <clears throat> and and in order to sort of get people's attention that hey maybe this a, you know this uh, college isn't as expensive as a uh, as you might think it is right uh, because I think a lot of people look at that sticker price and then are are scared away. Well, as promised, I told I, I told us uh, we'd all get out of here by 1 p.m. We're going to do that. Um, please note that today's webinar will be recorded and made available on the itga.org website. In the next few days, that will include slides as well. We're so grateful to our speakers today, Chronicle of Higher Education reporter Eric Kelderman, Indian board member at the Ohio Mayor Steve Patterson, Chicago Loop Alliance CEO Michael Edwards, and Otterbein University President John Comerford. Once again, if you have any extra questions, outreach at itga.org. Finally, we hope everyone here who has joined us today will consider joining the ITGA at its annual conference this year in Boulder, Colorado, June 1 through 3rd. See our website, itga.org, for details. On behalf of ITGA Executive Director Beth Bagwell, today's webinar producer Douglas Schantz, and ITGA's hundreds of members in multiple countries, Thanks for your inputs, ideas, and engagement on all things Town Gown. Best and thanks to everyone from the International Town Gown Association, and have a good day.